Hello, my name is Rick Sheffer. This presentation is about the history and evolution of our understanding and harassing of one of nature's natural forces, electricity, and how the science of electricity evolved from a freak phenomenon of nature through man's effort to try and understand it and finally control it to use it for useful work. When I was a kid back in Pennsylvania, I was heavily influenced by the movie Young Tom Edison. Seeing the inventions evolve on the TV screen, combined with the mechanical heritage of my family, I used to take apart electrical devices, as well as make some of my own. My interest in nature's wonders continued into college, where I majored in math and physics. This video will briefly review several significant discoveries about the nature of electricity, then proceed to several electromechanical machines that changed the world in the mid-1800s. Finally, we will explore the battle between Edison's direct current technology and George Westinghouse's alternating current, developed primarily by Nikola Tesla in what has been called the First Standard War, which would determine what type of electricity would power the Second Industrial Revolution. With that said, let us begin our journey. Electricity is a form of energy involving the flow of electrons from atoms. When the balancing force in atoms between positive charged photons and negative charged electrons is upset by an outside force, an atom may gain or lose an electron. When electrons are lost from an atom, the free movement of these electrons constitutes an electric current. You might think of the flow of electrons through a wire similar to how water flows through a hose. The electrical current through a wire can be compared to the volume of water flowing through a hose, and the force behind the flow of water is similar to the voltage in an electrical system. The higher the voltage, the greater the force pushing the electrons through the wire. Ancient Egyptian text made the first recorded reference to what we call electricity. This document referred to electric fish as the thunder of the Nile and described them as the predators of all other fish. In 900 BCE, legend has it that a Greek shepherd walked across a field of black stones which pulled the iron nails out of his sandals. This was the discovery of magnetism in the form of lodestone. And in 600 BCE, another Greek made a series of observations on static electricity from which he believed that friction rendered amber magnetic. Of course, when he rubbed amber with cat fur, he could pick up bits of feathers and produce sparks, and for the next 2200 years, nothing new would be learned about electricity and magnetism until the beginning of the 17th century. Then, over the next 240 years, man became curious about the natural world and as a result, the following discoveries regarding the nature of electricity and magnetism were made. In the 1600s, definitions evolved such as electric force, magnetic pull, and electric attraction. The term electricity came from the Greek word for amber, electron. In 1740, the Leyden jar, the world's first capacitor, was invented which could store a static electric charge. A few years later, Ben Franklin discovered that static electricity and lightning were one and the same phenomena, and invented one of the first devices ever used to control and direct electricity, the lightning rod. In 1800, the voltaic pile, the or first battery, was invented so that now a more reliable source of electrical current could be tapped. In 1822, electromagnetic induction was discovered that will allow electric current to be stepped up or down. This was the transformer. In 1823, the principle of electromagnetic rotation led directly to the principle of the electric motor. And in 1824, the principle of the dynamo, or electric generator, was discovered. And if you move a permanent magnet inside a coil of wire, you induce an electric current. A year later, 
In 1825, the principle of electromagnetism was discovered, that by wrapping a piece of metal with a coil of wire and inducing a current, you created a magnet. And in 1834, the first practical DC electric motor was invented. More was discovered about the nature of electricity and magnetism in this 12-year span than had been discovered or known in the previous 4,600 years. Now the age of electrical and mechanical invention could begin. More was discovered about the nature of electricity and magnetism in this last 12-year span than had been discovered in the previous 4,600 years. Now the age of electrical and mechanical invention could begin, where men of genius would link the building blocks of electromagnetism and create electrical and mechanical inventions that change the world forever, and, as we shall see, in the process established the electrical standard that governs the electrical use world over. For a second, let's explore how these principles are applied to a simple DC motor. Remember the principle of electromagnetic rotation. Well, this principle is applied to the operations of a simple DC electric motor. The parts of the motor are a permanent electromagnet where the north and south poles stay constant, a rotating electromagnet where the north and south poles click on and off with each rotation of the shaft. This turning on and off of the current is caused by the commutator and brushes which act as a switch that cuts off the current to the rotating electromagnet with each half turn. The momentum of the rotating device carries the shaft through the next active point of the brushes, which again activates the rotating electromagnet, which is again attracted and repelled by the permanent magnet. And of course, the power source, a battery, or in the case of my demonstration, a transformer. Now, into the age of electrical mechanical discovery. We start with the invention of the telegraph, which was perhaps the first practical electromechanical device invented based on these principles. It was also the first use of electricity for commercial communications, when on May 1, 1844, the news that the Whig Party had nominated Henry Clay for president was transmitted from Annapolis Junction to Washington, D.C. Electromechanical communications took another giant leap in 1876 when Alexander Graham Bell invented the talking telegraph. No more dots and dashes. Now the human voice could be transmitted over the wires. The telephone, again using electromagnetism, converted sound vibrations into electrical impulses. These electrical impulses were then transferred down a wire to a receiving device that reconstituted the electrical impulses into the originating sound waves. Now actual human conversations could be transmitted over long distances. What a remarkable invention of the time. Now, just about this time, electrical development was shifting from sound to light, and three people would lead this technological wave into the future. They were Thomas Alva Edison, Nikola Tesla, and George Westinghouse. These titans of industries clash head to head in order to determine what type of electricity would fuel the 20th century. Over 1,700 patents for electrical devices will bear their names, a remarkable achievement by any standard. First, let's start with Thomas Edison. Thomas Alva Edison rose from modest circumstances to become one of the most prolific and influential inventors in the history of the United States. He is perhaps best known for his invention of the first practical incandescent electric lamp, but we would say he was most proud of his invention of the phonograph. But Edison also invented the motion picture camera, and these three inventions formed the basis of the sound recording industry, the electric power industry, and the motion picture industry. Not bad, wouldn't you say? Most people do not associate Edison with creating the world's first motion picture studio, but he did. 
But first, he had to invent the movie camera, which he did, and he had to build the first movie studio at his West Orange plant in New Jersey, which he did in 1892. He nicknamed the studio the Black Mariah because it resembled a police paddy wagon by that name. The movie set used natural sunlight, so in order to optimize available light, the set would be rotated by hand and thus following the sun's path across the sky. In 1903, Edison released E.S. Porter's The Great Train Robbery, which became one of Edison's most popular motion pictures. Thomas Edison also made significant improvements to the telegraph and telephone. His patent for the carbon powder microphone replaced Bell's device and was still being used on telephones until recent times. Edison also devised new methods to process iron ore using electromagnets and he developed a manufacturing process for making Portland cement and developed a process for manufacturing complete cement houses. Some of these cement homes are still in use today. Edison also invented the mimeograph reproduction process that most of us remember by the smell of our test papers in school. He sold his patent to the A.B. Dick Company of Chicago. Edison also invented a new type of storage battery designed to power electric vehicles. In 1876, Edison opened his laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, a small village on the Pennsylvania Railroad approximately 25 miles west of New York City. He vowed to produce a minor invention every 10 days and a big thing every six months. Edison secured 400 patents at Menlo Park between 1876 and 1882 and employed more than 200 experimenters. The complex consisted of the 100-foot-long laboratory building, a machine shop, a carpenter shop, a glass blowing shed, as well as a gasoline plant that powered the complex. Before his inventing days were through, Edison would be granted a staggering 1,093 patents in the United States alone, which is the record for the highest number of patents ever granted to an individual. Most of the inventions Edison worked on involved an intricate linkage of electricity and mechanics referred to as electric mechanical devices, where electrical current activated clock-like machinery of gears, cogwheels, and levers. For Edison, technical innovation involved more than solving technical problems in his laboratories. Edison was also an entrepreneur and business leader. From the early 1870s to the late 1920s, he created and managed dozens of companies to manufacture and market his inventions. He also raised capital to finance his companies, established manufacturing facilities, identified potential markets for his inventions, and tailored marketing and advertising strategies to reach those markets while employing thousands of workers. Not only did he have a movie studio in his West Orange, New Jersey factory, he also had his own audio recording studio. Here he would bring in famous singers, musicians, and entire orchestras and record their talent for replaying on his music boxes. Thomas Edison was born on February 11, 1847 in Milan, Ohio. In 1854 his family moved to Port Huron, Michigan. Edison received little formal education. He attended school briefly in Port Huron but his mother provided most of his education at home. Edison later claimed that his teachers kicked him out of school because they thought he was addled, but his family, out of their lack of resources, may have prevented longer school attendance. His mother took over the role of educator. For three years, starting in 1850, Edison worked as a newspaper and candy vendor on the Grand Trunk Railroad between Port Huron and Detroit. Edison stored in the baggage car a stock of newspapers and candy, a small collection of chemicals for experiments, and a printing press he used to publish his newspaper, The Weekly Herald. 
The railroad fired Edison after he tipped over a bottle of phosphorus and set the car on fire. He became profoundly deaf around this time, and one story had it that a train conductor boxed his ears because of the fire on the baggage car, but that has never been fully confirmed. At any rate, Edison never felt handicapped because of his deafness, but rather said it was a benefit to his ability to focus on the tasks at hand. The Mount Clements station master taught Edison Morse code in appreciation for saving his young son from a runaway freight car. This gave Edison the professional training that allowed him to join the growing ranks of skilled telegraph operators during the Civil War. At age 16, Edison left home and began a five-year odyssey as a vagabond telegraph operator, taking briefly held jobs in Detroit, New Orleans, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Memphis. In 1868, Edison took a telegraph job in Boston, the country's leading center of inventions and the cradle of Yankee ingenuity. It was in Boston that Edison committed himself to being a full-time inventor, inspired by the works of Michael Faraday. In January of 1869, a small item in a trade journal announced his intentions to the world. It read, Thomas A. Edison, formerly a telegraph operator, would hereafter devote his full time to bringing out his own inventions. Edison had little talent for abstraction and no patience for mathematics. His orientation was visual and linear, an approach that served him well as long as the problem was similarly constructed. He never tired of trial and error research, but using theoretical logic and mathematics was not in his mental toolkit. Edison was generally graphically depicted as a prodding, serious genius inventor, a wizard, willing to conduct thousands of experiments until he finally arrived at the solution he sought. However, on one fact he stood steadfast, his commitment to direct current as his power source of choice, and steadfast he was. When Edison began to focus on developing a practical electric light bulb, he was following on the 1860 work of an English physicist and chemist, Joseph Swan. Swan had invented what is considered to be the first incandescent lamp. But the problem with Swan's lamp was the filament quickly turned to ash under the heat. So Edison put his team testing literally thousands of filament material that they had to carbonize and seal inside a glass bulb. And they were achieving some success. In the fall of 1878, with little more than a 10-minute bulb in hand, Edison began calling on reporters from the New York newspapers, drumming up publicity for his latest invention. Edison wanted the publicity not for his own vanity, but rather to attract Wall Street investors. His press campaign had its desired effect. The money men of Wall Street, financiers J.P. Morgan and W.H. Vanderbilt, put up a total of $300,000 to create a new company, the Edison Electric Light Company. Edison agreed to assign to the newly formed company all his inventions in the lighting field for the next five years. Edison returned to first principles. Above all, the lamp would need to be fed with a steady, reliable flow of direct current. For that purpose, Edison built from scratch an improved dynamo, a tall, upright mass of iron, magnets, and coiled wire nicknamed the long-waisted Marianne. Edison experimented with different voltages. Too much and the delicate filament would quickly overheat and break. Not enough and the light would flicker. Edison finally settled on supplying his lamps with 110 volts of electricity, a decision that, more or less, is still with us today. On November 1, 1879, Edison executed a patent for the first practical, long-lasting incandescent bulb. The dawn of the age of electricity was at hand. In February 1881, Edison moved from Menlo Park to New York City 
to fulfill his next mission, bringing electric power to the Big Apple. To do this, Edison and his team would have to invent a complex system of interlocking technologies to complement the incandescent lamp. Switches, meters, sockets, fixtures, regulators, underground conductors, junction boxes, and most importantly, a central station to generate DC power and a distribution network to deliver it. On September 4, 1882, at 3 in the afternoon, the giant dynamos at Pearl Street began to spin, sending 110 volts of direct current flashing through the underground wires to the 59 customers Edison had managed to sign up by opening day. With Pearl Street up and running, Edison began leasing his technology to start up power companies in other locales and could barely keep up with the demand for his electrical power. By 1884, there were 18 central stations on the Edison system, producing DC power for U.S. cities including Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, and New Orleans. In the span of a few years, Edison built an electrical empire out of thin air. Now the angels in the wire were dancing to his tune. But his battle of the electric current was not a slam dunk. An alternative to direct current electrical system was primarily developed by another young genius, inventor Nikola Tesla, and prosecuted by an American entrepreneur and engineer, George Westinghouse. This system was based on alternating current. AC and DC current had different properties due to the dissimilar ways the current was generated and delivered. In the Edison DC system, the current flowed in one direction only, from the huge dynamos at Pearl Street directly to the customer's light bulb. With alternating current, the electricity flowed from the generator to the bulb, then from the bulb to the generator flipping back and forth dozens of times per second. In the summer of 1884, a stranger walked through the doors of the Edison Electric Company and introduced himself to Edison as a new employee. Edison sized up the newcomer, tall, dark-haired, thin as a rail, with raccoon-like circles under his eyes. The stranger handed Edison a letter of introduction, identifying himself as Nikola Tesla, a Serbian electrician from the Continental Edison Company in France. Edison was nine years older than Tesla, but the age difference seemed much greater. Tesla was a dreamy, 28-year-old immigrant trying to find his way in the new world. Unlike Edison, Tesla loved mathematics and abstract thinking. Tesla's mind was more like lightning. His insights were brilliant, unpredictable, and not always on target. Tesla was also a bundle of raw nerves and runaway phobias. During his lifetime, Tesla invented fluorescent lighting, the induction motor, the Tesla coil, and developed practically the entire alternating current, AC, electrical supply system used today. His AC inventions included the AC generator, AC transmission system, AC motor, AC transformer, and three-phase electricity. In his lifetime, Tesla held close to 300 patents. Tesla would wind up working for Edison less than a year, but the two men would be linked forever by fate and electricity, by AC and DC. Nikola Tesla was born in 1856 in Croatia. He was the son of a Serbian Orthodox clergyman. As a young boy, unexplained and often unwanted images and strong flashes of light would suddenly appear to Tesla, so lifelike they blocked his vision of real objects. His mind was unruly, mercurial, and utterly original. Tesla also suffered from what today would be diagnosed as obsessive compulsive disorder. He had a lifelong germ phobia. He was repulsed by the sight of objects with smooth surfaces and was obsessed with the number three. At the time, 
his symptoms were considered by some to be evidence of partial insanity. Tesla's favorite subject in school was math, and he was so adept at mental arithmetic that some teachers suspected him of cheating when he calculated complex mathematical problems without picking up a pencil. Languages also came easily. Tesla added German, Greek, Latin, French, and English to his native language. At the Polytechnic Institute of Austria, Tesla was exposed to a small DC motor that the professor used to demonstrate various effects of direct current to his students. One day the motor malfunctioned. The copper wire brushes that made and broke contact with the rotating mechanical commutator began to throw off sparks. The commutator and brushes are an essential element of a DC motor. They form a switching mechanism that reverses the current twice during each rotation of the motor. Tesla thought the whole commutator setup was inefficient. You never see a design like that in nature, he thought. Tesla applied his formidable powers of abstraction to the task. Motor designs dance in his head. And in 1880, Tesla moved to Prague and landed a job as chief electrician of the city's new telephone company. One day, while strolling through City Park, Tesla was transfixed by the sight of a dramatic blood-red sunset. At that moment, the sun seemed to him to be a swirling ball of energy, a gigantic rotating magnetic field. It was an epiphany. Tesla said the idea came to him like a flash, a flash of lightning, and in an instant the truth was revealed. He immediately picked up a stick and began to draw diagrams in the sand. The drawings would form the basis of a breakthrough patent Tesla received on May 1888, the induction motor. The induction motor was a new and vastly more efficient motor design that did away with the Tesla-dreaded commutator altogether. Instead of copper brushes constantly rubbing against metal to change the magnetic poles of the rotor, Tesla's motor was spun by rotating the magnetic field itself an idea suggested by the swirling magnetic field Tesla imagined in the Prague sunset. The induction motor operated without any moving electrical contacts, driven instead by an invisible magnetic field. By rapidly changing the rotating magnetic field, the Tesla motor could be spun in one direction, stopped on a dime, and rotated in the other way just as quickly. Tesla took a job with the Continental Edison near Paris, a French company making dynamos, lamps, and motors for the European market under Edison's patents. He came to the attention of Charles Batchelor, a longtime Edison assistant and manager of the plant. Batchelor encouraged Tesla to go to America and work for Edison directly, and gave the young electrician a letter of introduction. In the summer of 1884, Tesla sailed to New York City and landed with virtually no possessions to declare. Everything he had of value was stored in his head. Tesla went to Edison at the inventor's headquarters on Fifth Avenue. One account has Tesla producing Bachelor's letter of introduction to Edison, which supposedly read, I know two great men, and you are one of them. The other is this young man. For nearly a year, Tesla regular workday stretched from 10.30 one morning until 5 o'clock the next. Tesla claimed Edison had offered him $50,000 bonus, equal to about $1.2 million today, if he redesigned Edison's inefficient motor and generators, making an improvement in both service and economy. In 1885, when Tesla inquired about the payment for his work, Edison replied, Tesla, you don't understand our American humor. In Tesla's mind, Edison had broken his word. In any event, Tesla quit the Edison works in the spring of 1885 when he was refused a raise. 
In November and December of 1887, Tesla filed for seven U.S. patents in the field of polyphase AC motors and power transmission. These comprised a complete system of generators, transformers, transmission lines, motors, and lighting. These patents would turn out to be the most valuable patents since the telephone, patents that George Westinghouse became very interested in owning. George Westinghouse was a Pittsburgh-based inventor and industrialist famous for devising the railroad air brake, a safety device that saved countless lives. Westinghouse was a bear of a man, a large framed figure with a walrus mustache and a gentle manner. Born in 1846, a year before Edison, Westinghouse was raised in an atmosphere of invention. His father had a bustling farm machinery shop and was awarded seven patents for threshing machines and sewing machines. In 1868, Westinghouse came up with what would be his most famous invention, the railroad air brake. Before the Westinghouse brake, it took nearly a mile to stop a fully loaded passenger train traveling just 10 miles per hour. With the Westinghouse brake, a train traveling 30 miles per hour could be halted in just 500 feet. Westinghouse eventually became a world-class inventor in his own right, credited with nearly 400 patents. But Westinghouse's outward nature also made him a natural deal-maker. Westinghouse began to turn his attention to electricity. In December of 1885, Westinghouse joined with his brother and a handful of other backers to form the Westinghouse Electric Company with capital stock of $1 million. The main assets of the company were 27 patents relating to mostly to direct current electricity that Westinghouse had bought up. With Edison's near monopoly of the DC market, Westinghouse turned his sights to the new technology emerging in Europe alternating current. One of DC's biggest shortcomings was that it could not be transmitted much more than a mile from the central station without significantly losing power. Alternating current, on the other hand, could be made to travel farther thanks in part to the invention of the transformer. With the transformer, alternating current could be easily stepped up to a higher voltage, which could travel through thinner, cheaper wire then step down for use in the homes and offices. Believing that AC was worth a gamble, Westinghouse went out and bought the best AC patents he could find from Europe and opened his first commercial AC plant in Buffalo, New York. Soon he had orders to build more than two dozen AC central stations. By the end of 1886, Westinghouse Electric employed 3,000 people, still considerably fewer than the Edison's global electrical empire, but he was becoming a significant rival and a growing threat to Edison. But Westinghouse's AC system still lacked one crucial piece of the complete electrical system, a reliable motor that would run on AC current. Nearly all the commercial motors at the time ran on Edison's DC system. Tesla had been shopping his induction motor for two years after leaving Edison with no success, though. However, on May 1, 1888, he was awarded a series of patents, among them one for the electromagnet motor and one for electrical transmission of power. The latter patent detailed how alternating current could be used to drive the motor that would become known as the Tesla polyphase system. The induction motor was simplicity itself, rotating without any moving electrical contacts. It made DC motors look clunky by comparison. When Westinghouse heard about Tesla's alternating current invention, he thought it could be the missing link in long-distance power transmission. He came to Tesla's lab and made an offer, purchasing the patents for $60,000 which included 5,000 in cash and 150 shares of stock in the Westinghouse Corporation. He also agreed to pay royalties of $2.50 
per horsepower of electrical capacity sold. Once the deal was signed, Tesla moved to Pittsburgh and worked beside Westinghouse for nearly a year, adapting the Tesla motor to the Westinghouse system. Now with the breakthrough provided by Tesla's patents, a full-scale industrial war erupted. At stake, in effect, was the future of industrial development, not just in the United States, but the world. And whether Edison's direct current or Westinghouse's alternating current would be the chosen technology to power it. It was time for Edison to launch a propaganda war against alternating current as assurance for his DC current technologies. The electrical industry was still in its infancy, but fortunately for Edison, ambitious young men were already promoting themselves as experts in the field. Harold Brown was such a self-appointed authority. Like many who claimed the title electrical engineer, Brown had only a rudimentary knowledge of electricity. Brown's self-interest outstripped his judgment, and his ambition outran them both. New electrical lines were being strung in New York every week, faster than they could be safely installed. New York newspapers began to feature a recurring story, the death by electricity of an unsuspecting victim, usually with sensational headlines. Harold Brown read the articles and saw not danger but opportunity. In June 1888, he wrote a strongly worded letter to the editor of the New York Post, blaming a string of recent electrical deaths on the use of alternating current. Brown was out to prove that AC was a damnable death current, while DC was completely harmless. Brown proposed a series of experiments to compare the relative dangers of AC and DC in a way that could easily be understood by the public. Brown called on Edison at the Inventor's New Laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey, and asked for a loan of electrical instruments. To his surprise, Edison invited him to make experiments at his laboratory and placed all necessary apparatus to his disposal. In July of 1888, Brown was ready to start his AC and DC tests, designed to prove the dangers of AC and the safety of DC. Word was put out that the Edison lab would pay 25 cents for every stray dog delivered to its door. Neighborhood boys led the roundup, and the lab soon had more than enough subjects for Brown's experiments. Without going into too many specifics, Brown used different current levels, experimented by electrocuting some 40 dogs, several horses and cows, and he even attempted to electrocute a full-grown rogue circus elephant named Topsy. The battle of the currents finally escalated to the point where the state of New York instituted the country's first criminal execution laws specifying that electricity be used for capital punishment instead of hanging. The first victim came in the person of William Kemmler, an illiterate, alcoholic, vegetable peddler from Buffalo who killed his live-in girlfriend with an axe. The execution was carried out on August 6, 1890, when two 1,700 volts of alternating current was passed through Kemmler's body. Edison and Brown used this incident as a continual proof that alternating current was unsafe, ignoring the fact that DC current could be used to the same purpose with the same effect. After Kimbler's execution, George Westinghouse needed some good news. The AC standard he had worked so hard to establish now carried the stench of death. Edison, for his part, was again on the prowl for another chance to prove his distractors wrong and hand Westinghouse another stinging defeat. The opportunity wasn't long in coming. The city of Chicago had announced its plans to hold a grand fair to commemorate the 400th anniversary of America's discovery by Christopher Columbus. The Columbian Exposition was to be the largest of its kind ever held in America, and electricity 
was to be the star attraction. Chicago Fair organizers planned to design buildings around the artful use of artificial illumination and to use electricity as the fair's exclusive power source. The contract to provide power and light to the fair was put up for bid and the competition was intense. Being chosen as the company to bring electricity to the Gaudi Affair would be a major coup for the winning concern. The fair covered more than 600 acres, featuring nearly 200 new buildings of classical architecture, canals and lagoons, and people and cultures from around the world. Edison's General Electric Company and the Westinghouse Corporation immediately locked horns in the bidding war for the fair. Everyone thought General Electric would get the bid due to Edison's association, but Westinghouse wanted it badly. The General Electric Company had proposed to power the electric exhibits with the direct current and bid the job at $554,000. However, Westinghouse underbid GE by proposing to illuminate the exposition with alternating current for $399,000. And in May of 1892, the contract to provide power and light to the fair was awarded to the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. In retaliation for losing the bid, Edison wanted to prevent the use of his electric light bulbs in Tesla's works. So General Electric banned the use of Edison lamps in Westinghouse's lighting plan. The Westinghouse chief engineer quickly sidestepped Edison's patents with a double stopper light bulb design that greatly reduced the cost and in increasing the life of the lamp. Westinghouse immediately built a new glass factory for the project and churned out a quarter of a million lamps in less than a year, a remarkable marshalling of manufacturing war resources by any standard. When the fair opened on May 1, 1893, visitors entered an electrical wonderland the likes of which they had never seen. 100,000 people jammed the court of honor to watch President Grover Cleveland turn a golden lever that sent the Westinghouse dynamo engines into motion, powering the fair's hundreds of thousands of lamps and all of its machinery. The spectacular lighting bathed the fairgrounds in a magical glow. Children author L. Frank Baum was so enthralled by the sight that he used it as an inspiration for the Emerald City in his Wizard of Oz book series. About 27 million people visited the exposition, nearly a quarter of the country's population at the time. The Ferris wheel made its debut, and for 50 cents, riders were packed 60 to a car and hoisted 264 feet into the air, giving them a commanding view of the fair's buildings. However, the exhibits that made the most vivid impressions on visitors were housed in the electricity building where Westinghouse and General Electric squared off eye to eye. The company's respective displays were adjacent to each other in the same hall. Westinghouse displayed a complete polyphase electrical system including an AC generator with transformers, a short transmission line, another set of transformers to step down their voltage, and a rotary converter that transformed some of the AC power into a direct current for engines that still ran on DC. Adjacent to the Westinghouse display stood the General Electric Company exhibit, which also featured a polyphase AC system, alternating current from an Edison company. And this was only possible now that Edison had practically no control over the company he founded. The most impressive exhibit of all, the one that really changed the course of technology, was a display that practically no one saw. It was the massive Westinghouse machinery that powered the entire fair, hidden in the bowels of the Hall of Machinery. The Chicago Fair would prove to be an important victory for Westinghouse and a turning point in the public's perception of alternating current. 
and the fair put Westinghouse forces in a leading position for an even bigger project, one that Tesla had dreamed about since he was a boy, powering Niagara Falls. The falls had long been an inviting source of generating power. About one-fifth of the U.S. population lived within 400 miles of Niagara, and Buffalo, a city of 250,000, was only 20 miles away. The flow of water over the falls was steady and reliable, making it ideal for spinning a turbine smoothly to produce a continuous flow of electricity. Designing a power plant that the falls could transmit electricity many miles away posed enormous technical challenges, and local officials at first turned to the country's most famous electrical expert, Thomas Edison. In 1889, Edison submitted a plan for building a DC power station and distribution system at the falls. Westinghouse was unwilling to reveal the company's trade secrets for AC transmission with no guarantee of a deal. However, Westinghouse employees urged the company to submit a proposal, which they finally did. To evaluate proposals, a five-man International Niagara Commission was appointed, headed by one of the leading physicists of the day, Sir William Thompson. Thompson was a direct current man through and through, and considered AC an unproven and unnecessary alternative. But in spite of Thompson's bias, the contract for electrifying the falls went to the Westinghouse Electric Company and alternating current technology. It was a triumph not just for Westinghouse Company, but for alternating current as a technical standard. Westinghouse would end up providing the AC generators, switch gear, and auxiliary equipment for the power plant at Niagara. General Electric was given a decidedly standard role in the project, supplying transformers and maintaining the AC transmission line to Buffalo. The first two Westinghouse generators roared into service in August of 1895, sending alternating current crackling down the line to Buffalo and beyond. For Tesla, the Niagara project was the culmination of a lifelong dream. As a youth, he had vowed to travel to faraway America and harness the energy of Niagara Falls. Tesla said few projects in his wide-ranging career gave him more satisfaction. He would lay it later liken the Niagara Project to the building of the pyramids, a monument worth of our scientific age, a true monument of the Enlightenment and of peace. The availability of cheap and abundant power spurred the industrial development throughout western New York, and before long, power was being sent to New York City more than 450 miles away. In the decades to follow, electricity from the falls transformed Detroit into the Motor City, powering the city's assembly lines and steel furnaces. Niagara became the model for the way electrical power would be generated and consumed in the 20th century and beyond. Niagara removed the last serious doubt about the efficiency of the AC system and settled once and for all which way electrical technology would light and power the world. Alternating current won the day. Thank you very much for your kind attention to my presentation today.